G'day everybody, my name's Alex Painbridge. Thanks for joining us for this latest episode of The Green Left Show. Today we're gonna to be discussing welfare policy in the lead up to the federal election. Before we get started, I do want to acknowledge that we are filming this show on the stolen Aboriginal land. We pay our respects to elders and warriors past and present, and we pledge our solidarity with ongoing struggles for justice for Aboriginal people. As I said, we're gonna be discussing welfare policy in the lead up to the election. I'm joined today by three special guests. Firstly, Hayden Patterson, who describes himself as an accidental activist. He's also a board member of the ACOS, the Australian Council of Social Services, and a former president of the Australian Unemployed Workers Union. Also joined by Amanda, Say No, Say no 7 uh, campaign, and Angela Carr, who is a Socialist Alliance candidate for the Senate in Geelong. Now, as I said, we're gonna be discussing welfare issues, welfare policy in the lead up to the election, and in particular, the questions related to the cashless welfare card and also the, the shamefully low rate of job seeker. In particular, what you'll notice is that the discussion focused quite a lot on the, on the promises made by Labor Party and the limits to those promises. Um, it's very important, we think, to neither bash the Labor Party unfairly, but also to hold them to account and to examine closely the limits and the uh, exactly what it is Labor has promised. And you'll find that that is exactly what we've done in this show today. Uh, there are a variety of points of view. I won't say it's a heated discussion, but certainly passionate and, and perhaps a bit fiery. And yeah, and different points of view. So stay tuned for those. Let's get underway. We're having a discussion today about uh, welfare policy in the lead up to this coming federal election. But I think before we get um, started with the specific uh, discussion about the election issues, I wanted to put it in the context of we've had like four decades of neoliberalism, which has involved huge attacks on welfare, plus also living standards and social rights in general. But I guess if you especially look at welfare, I mean, we've gone from a situation where there was once a universal age pension, now it's means tested. We've had this huge escalation of job network activities and hoops and work for the doll and like basically attacks on unemployment benefit. Um, you know, there's been, uh, 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 big massive shift to try and push people off the disability pension onto um, new start or job seeker. Uh, we've had the last government raise the retirement age up to 67. We've got the current government giving us robo debt. Uh, there's basically a, a whole decades and decades long attacks on welfare. So if we can just start, maybe I'll go through everybody one by one in turn. Uh, why, what are the reasons that we should defend welfare? Why should welfare be defended, both from the point of view of the dignity of the welfare recipients, but also society at large? Maybe Hayden, do you want to get, do you want to get, get started? Sure. I mean, I grew up in a country where we were socially responsible and we looked after those around us. But I mean, I myself come from three generations of welfare dependents and I come from the very northern suburbs of Adelaide, which is a pretty rough area. And no one really expected anything or um, gave opportunity that was given to other people. No one. In, I've got 27 siblings. No one in my family went to university. And I've got people like um, ScoMo sitting on $1,960 a day. Uh, that's before expenses and allowances telling me that $44 is enough. And if I can't afford somewhere to rent, go buy a house. Like it, it's ridiculous, the inequity and disparity that's growing. So, you know, I, I think it's important that we look after each other and make sure that we save this. And, and just to, stop it, dog. And just to close that, I mean, the social security system was set up by the founder of the Liberal Party. It's unbelievable we've got to this stage where every man's in for himself. Uh, Amanda, what are your thoughts? Okay, I come at it um, a little distance, a little impersonally. Um, one, you know, is social security isn't a burden on society. It's actually an economic stabiliser, a stabiliser. And when we did the maths um, using the RBA formula, we discovered that um, the total, like the total spending on social security, is ultimately only a, only a part of that goes towards payments. And when we looked at just payment spending of one hundred and forty three to forty nine billion, uh, we found out that it economically inserts seven hundred and fifty billion in 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 economic output. So, when you consider that ninety percent of that payment spend is going to landlords and food shops and things like that. These are the ultimate end receivers. They are the ultimate welfare recipients. Every every local shop owner that employs a staff member 
when when we're talking about welfare though here i'm talking about cash-based welfare the minute you digitize that you're talking about giving it out to you know foreign companies through online and we're talking about removing that money from from the system anyway but generally speaking with the knock-on effect is um, is that it produces an income for the community and it's spent locally for the community the other one um the other, the other part of that, which, you know, is one that public government spending doesn't rely on taxation and this whole myth around, it's not even mon modern monetary theory, it's just the whole myth that it does and that your taxes are paying for welfare. It's like, no, but people receiving welfare do help you pay your taxes. So there's this whole the whole propaganda surrounding welfare and taxes is ideologically based. It's not actually based in fact. And when we look at the value knock-on for the individual and we're looking for the community and we're looking then for national security, um, the impact of reducing welfare payments, you know, is, comes back in, in rising insurance costs, rising crime, rising need to access services, et cetera, et cetera. So it actually costs more to reduce you know, than it does to um, then to maintain and this equilibrium of mutual support, which is what it was, mutual aid between those that have and those that don't have. And while that mutual aid has always been unbalanced towards the recipients, the, 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 that we have a system that was providing mutual aid that has been considerably attacked by consecutive governments. You know, it, but yeah, it's not about your taxpayer dollars. And that's one of my biggest bugbears about this whole thing. It's got nothing to do because public spending, government spending is not reliant on it. So that's my spiel. <laughs> um, Ange, maybe we turn to you. What are your thoughts? Why should welfare be defended? Yeah, so fundamentally, I just see this as being quite simply a human rights issue. So, you know, we think about it, the right to safe and secure housing, food, clean water, they're the most basic of human rights. So if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's the bare minimum that humans need to survive. And the reality is that we're always going to have a layer of people who, through no fault of their own, they might not have the capacity to work, and that might be because of illness, disability, carer status, poor mental health, you know, trauma, all those types of things. So it's really unconscionable to not provide a safety net for people in our community. Um, and, yeah, you you alluded to it, Alex, that um, welfare policy has been completely eroded after the last four decades. But the reality of that is now smacking the community in the face. Like there's mm. some people living in some very desperate situations at the moment. And I think um, the individualistic rhetoric from subsequent neoliberal governments and the media, you know, it's attempted to fuel the ideas of doll bludges or people that, you know, aren't giving it a go. They're not, you know, trying to help themselves. But we know that that's just nonsense. And I do believe that it's only really a small section of the community that kind of agrees or prescribes to that ideology. Um, and Hayden was saying it before, like, you know, humans are innately about helping each other. That's why we see people running into burning buildings to save strangers. Um, you know, it's part of our survival mechanism. So, I mean, it has been shown that the population is generally in favour um, of some kind of reforms around welfare policy, especially income support. Um, and I just think as a society, we can't continue to blurn it um, turn a blind eye to the growing inequality. I mean, homelessness is growing rapidly and there's such a large layer of people that have food insecurity that it's absolutely shocking. You know, I'm a community services worker, so I see this every day at work. People can't afford to buy nappies for their kids. They can't put food on the table. They can't pay their bills. You know, they can't access... Um, medical services because of money because you know access to good quality free medical care is also being eroded um, and I think the other part to this is too that there's actually not enough jobs for everyone capital has designed it that way you know the job market is competitive and it helps to keep wages low conditions poor and keeps the profit up for the bosses so I just think it's unbelievable in a wealthy country like ours that people should be living in poverty, you know, because we do have the resources for people to have a good life and good opportunities for their future. 
But what we're seeing under the current political conditions is we just head further and further away from basic human rights. And if I may just add, I mean, one of the things is for every 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 worker, the wage rates always get you know built from the bottom up. So if there's a really weak welfare system, it means that it makes it much easier for employers to employ all workers at um, shitty wages. And you, you see that in the United States with an even weaker welfare system than Australia. Um, the wage rates are miserable. Uh, and it's, it, it's kind of like if you just want to be able to walk around in society and not be fear of, you know, not be afraid of being mugged for someone who's so desperate they just need to get a little food to eat. Um, you know, welfare is, is, you know, is, is good for everybody. Now, I want to turn to some of the issues in particular that are coming up at this election. One of these is the Indu Income Management Card. The ALP is making a big point about the fact that they're not going to extend this Indu um, card uh, to aged pensioners, and they're basically either implying or stating that the LNP will. Um, the LNP is basically reacting, oh, this is just a scare campaign, although one of the things that I have, uh, my impression about this is that they're actually very... Uh, it's sort of all non-denial denials. I haven't actually heard an LNP rep specifically and unambiguously say, we will not extend the India card to, to age pensioners. Now, um, we'll go through this again. There's a few issues I wanted to raise, but maybe, Amanda, can you just start off by addressing addressing your thoughts on this India card? Well, the, re the really big elephant in the room is that age pensioners are already on the card. Shh. Yeah. Okay, and we've been trying to scream this out to everybody for the last year and a half since the, well, two years, since December 2020, when the pension was actually put into the legislation for the first time as a compulsory payment. That was the point of continuation bill. You had the expansion into the territory, you had the idea to make it permanent, which they knew would never happen. But the key point was getting this payment into that legislation as a compulsory payment. Now, this is the legislation I study. I sleep I think I dream in this legislation, so I can absolutely tell you there is nothing preventing the NLP from including the age pension payment if they want to in a future bill. At the moment, there is a three word caveat that limits it in the in the legislation in each different region except Cape York. But I've just sent to the page here to chat the two videos, DSS not just admitting that there are 400, 747 age pensioners already on basics cards are compulsory, um, that there are 25 age pensioners on cash or debit card or CDC compulsorily, nine, sorry, are volunteers out of that 25. And we also have DSS on tape in Senate estimates. These are both Senate estimates its records so they're available for anyone to find. Um, DSS admitting on tape that the age pension payment is being uh, manipulated in the monthly data sets by being put under other payments instead of listed as age, you know, age pension like all the other in the data sets all the other payments are in a list and then they've got other payments. So we've got the department admitting to that thanks to Nita Green from ALP who actually asked the question what are they doing here? So we've actually got that. And they're still denying that age pensioners, that they said absolutely none anywhere uh, would be going on it. And yet we, here we have the department saying they are. So clearly they're already on the cut. We also have questions on notice that were delivered uh, during estimates that the department is required to legally respond. We have that proof and evidence as well. Um, so yeah, we have all the data, where you can locate it, everything on our page, say no seven resources. Um, so we, we have all the information there. But this focus on simply on the age pension decries the fact that disability pensioners, carers pensioners, which is what I wanted to add it before, the current minimum wage is $2.70 per hour. And it's a carer working 24 hours a day who can't access NIDS, all right, I'm sorry, NDIS. Um, you know, that's what she's getting. On a, on a carer's payment for, for, for working 24 hours a day, seven days a week is $2.70 per hour. And this is why payments have to go up. But, um, you know, you, ALP have not been ambiguous this last couple of weeks. A, a few weeks ago, I wrote a letter and other people started this push to go, look, we need this off the back benches. We need this out front because people aren't believing us. And then boom, big Jim Chalmers and everyone started coming forward. And it was brilliant that move to make it an election issue. And the ALP have called it a key election issue. And it has to be. We are talking about this legislation that ultimately institutes segregation in Australia as a formal policy. And it's not 
not staying in remote communities out there in the distant where they want. Your ALP is desperate, sorry, NLP is desperately trying to make it just an Aboriginal problem out there somewhere so people don't make the connection that their next door neighbour is going to be on a card or they might be imposed. So our job this week has been about bringing that back to the fact that 40.9% of people on the card today live in urban areas and they are white and this card is going national. And we have all of that data and the evidence for that on our pages. But as you can see, one after the other, AAP, RMIT, even ABC, which was heartbreaking to see, um, you know, have just been attack, attack, attack in an attempt to undermine the facts. Like these aren't our facts. They're not our facts. I'm not making them up. These are government records, government federal legislation. So, you know, um, that's where the age uh, pension is. We know that it will be extended but under the NLP because they've already voted to do that. <laughs> they've passed a motion in Queensland to vote out to, to expand to more regions there. The national rollout of CDC started in 2015. It's not starting tomorrow. It started in 2015 using Aboriginal suffrage and Aboriginal problems in communities as a pretext to launch this. They knew that racist Australia, they knew that they would buy into these pretexts, but the, the monetary shift that this is, the social segregation shift taking us to almost Palestinian style segregated citizenship based on your social value. You know, I wouldn't call it a China style. That's not here yet, but it certainly does um, based on, you know, public perceptions of you as a human being that is already evident in, sorry, in the Israel-Palestine conflict that you can actually see segregated citizenship occurring depending on your race, colour, social standing is how much freedom that you get. So we're actually implementing this system of segregation masters of welfare policy and it's occurring right in front of people's faces and sometimes they just want to do that Gordon thing you know where he puts people's faces and squeezes because people can't see it it's like but it's right there so um yeah um I'm just reading the question you said they're making a big point of saying they will not extend it the ALP have said they're going to scrap it they're not just scrapping like they're just going to amend the CDC legislation um we have it from the elbows office they are ending it and better it was albo's idea to do that all right it was his idea to put that forward nobody else's so he's just gone we're scrapping it and now the rest just have to flutter and make that happen because you know he's called it and he's going to do it um i have no qualms there one of the questions here was about trust when it comes to the cash step card and ending it i have absolutely no no qualm that they will end it you know, what happens with basics is a different question, but I know that because it's Linda Burney and I don't have much of a relationship with Linda Burney's office, uh, Catherine might have a better relationship there, but on CDC, they are ending it. And the repealing legislation is already there, sitting there, repeals the whole thing and ends the program. So they've already acted on their commitment. I'm not just blindly trusting Albo's office staffers. I'm actually watching their actions because I don't vote for parties. I vote for people and based on their actions alone. So, you know, that's where it stands as far as our campaign is concerned. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I probably was too equivocal in the question that you're right, the ALP has promised to scrap the Indu card um, the question of trust, though, comes back to the basics card because that's actually, um, you know, it's one thing to sort of make the promise they're going to scrap into you. If they keep the basics card, that still is income management. I wonder, Hayden, if you've got any comments about that. Here's the thing. I was just going to say last week, Linda Burney's office has come out and already said they're going to abandon compulsory basics cards, that they will be making basics cards. Um, I can give you the link to that as well, that article. They've actually come out now and said, you know, this is what their plan is. And that's based on, you know, nearly six years with Linda Burney saying that in the Senate, saying it everywhere that they want to end compulsory income management. Um, sorry, saying it in her on her pages. And now it's actually policy. They're actually taking it as policy that to, to abandon compulsory income management cards. And there is a difference. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, Hayden, your comments? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, um, they're talking specifically about including pensioners. And my question to that, and I'm actually rather uh, insulted by it, is what about everyone else? Like, the fact is, we're dividing and conquering here. And by saying it's okay for some, but not for others, isn't it the same as when we rolled this out initially? And it was targeted towards Indigenous Australians. Yes. Um, quite some time ago, uh, it was relented that people could voluntarily apply to come off of the card. So 
in Sejuna in particular, 88 people applied over a year and a half ago to come off of the card. To date, only eight have been successful. The rest are just sitting there in no man's land. And I'll tell you right now that none of those people that have come off are Indigenous. Um, I, I just find it rather insulting that we go, as long as this little cohort is looked after, bugger everyone else. And um, I, I've seen the heartbreak that it, it brings into these families and the desperation every time I leave Sejuna in their eyes because no one is listening to them. But you could go and protect pensioners, for example, and not put them on the card. But if you think it's not affecting them, you're living under a rock. There are elderly people that are getting smacked in the side of their head with rock just out of the blue in the shadows because people are trying to steal money off them. This was not happening in Sejuna before the card was rolled out. And I'm sorry, I get a little bit emotional about this, but this is people's lives. I've well, can I address that from, <laughs> a, you know, I have to be a little cruel in that, you know, the, the reason that pensioners were the target focus was because we were coming up to an election and, uh, you know, over 53% <laughs> of the welfare spend, so to speak, I hate the word welfare, the social security spend is on age pension. And what you know, <laughs> we, both Hayden and I know, have been the horrific experiences. You know, we've sat up with cardholders every night for nearly seven years. What they're going through, can you? Can you imagine that? Like Jocelyn, you know Jocelyn Hayden, all right, 65 years old, on her birthday was put back on a cart. Okay, we know what's happening to the elder population. You know, she told her story in The Australian for the first time, so brave, but it even broke his heart, you know, the reporter's heart that on her, she was denied an exit on her 65th birthday. But it's more than that, it's a loss of life. It's all of this stuff. We know what the current group of people on it are suffering with would not, it would be what is horrific for this group of people would be catastrophic for age pensioners. You know, um, it would be catastrophic. We would It would make aged care losses over COVID look like nothing. So they are worth protecting as well. Our elders are worth defending and protecting. But from a political perspective, it was about how to wake up white Australia to the risks that are on their doorstep. And, you know. Hayden, did you want to finish? Yeah. Um, so the thing is, I'm related to half the town of Sejuna. <laughs> and so every time I go there, I meet more cousins what have you um and these people were told it's a 12-month trial and this is six years ago and they've had various people come in and have queen's visits and i call them queen's visits because they come in they get a perfect photo opportunity meet a couple of people that have nothing to do with living on the card and then they leave again and think they've actually consulted the town and they for example i don't blindly trust labor that they will repeal this card um, I got a meeting with Linda Burney's office, which <laughs> wasn't happening about two weeks ago, where I was. I spoke to a Labor MP and they explicitly said to me, um, if they were to win, they would immediately raise all income support payments by $100 a week and then do a review. And they would also talk about adjusting the taper rate so you could actually earn more money before you would lose money from your income support payments. Because in essence, if you were to get a job or even uh, some casual hours whilst you're on job seeker, you're paying 60 cents in the dollar as a tax rate. Who in Australia pays 60 cents an hour, a, a dollar out of each dollar that they learn? Um, and they also said that they would um, abolish all compulsory income management programs because their policy on the website currently says they just won't expand any further. There's a big difference between not expanding it and abolishing it. Um, no. I was then, Amanda, can I just finish? Yeah. I was then told by that MP that I would, because I've been hearing a lot of rhetoric about it and there's been a lot of discussion about it. And everyone says, a friend of a friend heard someone from Albo's office say this, and nothing is written down except the policy on the website. And so this MP said they would get back the following Tuesday uh, with a signed statement from Linda Burney and Bill Shorten. Uh, to guarantee what I just told you they said. Um, they didn't get back and things have gone a little bit wild on social media as we lead up to the election. And uh, I was just contacted yesterday to say uh, that there's a meeting with Linda Burney's office starting the week of the 9th of May. Um, I've already voted. <laughs> so we'll support in having a meeting then, but 
you know, I, I can't blindly back a party that, you know, when um, this not all started, blindly, and I really don't like I, the I, inference of being like told. Yeah, like when I uh, when I spoke with Don Farrell's office, I said um, that Bill Shorten came to Adelaide for a Q and A in May. I want to say 2020, uh, 2019, and he said, by all accounts, the people of uh, Sedona want to see this trial out. Um, that's not the case, and we went and did the um, research trip into Sedona and then produced the Sedona report. Ever since, um, Labor have been going, uh, maybe we'll raise the rate, maybe we won't, maybe we'll do a review, maybe we won't, maybe we'll stop the uh, rollout of the cashless welfare card, maybe we won't. Until there's something absolutely in guarantee or I see it happen, I, I don't know if I can believe it. Maybe we'll turn to Ange. I guess one thing even to, um, one thing I wanted to just clarify, even for people that maybe are unsure, what is even the problem with having income management? And I guess this also goes to the question of if, um, if a program still exists but is made voluntary, one of the problems with that is that the program still continues. I mean, like, um, uh, Ange, do you have any comments on this on this issue in general? So it's been really interesting hearing Amanda and Hayden speak because they obviously have a lot more experience um, around this issue than I do. So I might um, speak about it from a historical context a little bit and then get to um, the problem with implementation. So in terms of the Labor Party, I have to say I don't really trust Labor on this. Um, might reflect on that a little bit later but over the years we really have seen them go along with and extend punitive and toxic legislations that have been passed by previous governments um, and we know that when the Rudd Gillard government gained power after Howard they did not end the Northern Territory intervention um, or the use of income management that was introduced during the intervention um, and I will just quickly add that we know that there was no grounds for that Northern Territory intervention and it's been proven um, that the supposed allegations of widespread child abuse were actually, um, in fact, that was all based on a lie. So I think when we think about the INJU card or the basics card, um, as it was first known at implementation, so what it actually is, is it can quarantine um, up to a percentage of one's income. So I've seen different figures and I'm sure the other speakers would be have a lot more um, expert knowledge around this, but it can be up to 80% of someone's income. Um, and so that means people are restricted about what they can purchase, and where they can purchase it. So the whole idea originally was, or the whole idea is that people can purchase, you know, alcohol and smokes and use the money for gambling, that thing. Um, that was the government's reasoning to bring this in initially. So what we saw was um, the extension and a broad rollout of this punitive and paternalistic and, you know, a very racist um, scheme, you know, and mining magnate Twiggy Forrest had a big hand in this when the Abbott government commissioned him to take a lead in a project into Aboriginal employment and welfare in the Northern Territory. I mean, it's actually really absurd. You couldn't even make it up that someone like that was um, put in to head up a project like that. And really, this is just a colonizer's tool of control and oppression over Aboriginal communities. All of the initial trial sites were Aboriginal communities and still a vast majority of the ongoing sites remain Aboriginal communities. Um, this is a very racist and punitive um, scheme that's been allowed to um, become policy in Australia. And I mean, in its very implementation, people are subjected to horrific racism. I mean, even down to the segregation of people in lines in shops. I mean, it's completely appalling that, you know, in the year 2022, that this is continuing to happen in our country. We have a very long way to go as a nation. People are unable to have any autonomy over how or where they spend their money. And, you know, we see issues of people in remote communities still having to do 200 kilometre round trips to go and purchase groceries. And this is still like a really significant problem for communities. 
and you know just think about it like the cost of groceries in remote areas are astronomically high anyway um so is petrol people don't have access to transport you know so people can't even get the basics that they need um and so the government has really tries to promote this because they're trying to help communities with social issues but i can tell you what would help people in communities a decent bloody social and healthcare services that's actually what's required um and you know we can't forget the impact that genocide has had on communities and how the government is continuing to contribute to the social issues that people are experiencing i mean people need um access to quality mental health services they need access to appropriate housing thing that states they need access to food water you know education services services are the things that lift people out of poverty um not punitive income rationing schemes so you know the government um really has no desire to provide services for people this is their way of just managing um people and it actually costs the government a lot of money up to $9000 you know to manage each person on income support how about if you lifted you know their income support payments and provided them services you know it would go that would actually improve the quality of people's lives and we know the government doesn't care about doing that so i do think under the lnp government um it's fairly likely that the basics card will continue to be more broadly rolled out um especially to the long term unemployed whether they'll roll it out to aged care pensioners um in its totality i'm not sure about that they certainly wouldn't pitch that in the election they'd be um trying to skirt away from that, that's for sure but we know that they continue to introduce lots of punitive schemes by centrelink constantly so schemes that disadvantage single mothers you know, the constant cuts to things like the ndis the fact that it is so difficult to access the disability pension now you know it's near impossible for a great deal of people so it does really fit their mo just to keep um rolling this out broadly and i think it will be the long term unemployed that hit first to be honest um i do i am not confident about the labor party to be honest um because we have seen historically that labor do take a passive kind of back seat and they often just continue with the status quo position um and i do wonder if that's what they would do if they are to win government um i'm not i'm not yet totally convinced we'll we'll return to uh, amanda and then hayden i mean maybe um amanda if you could just address um, I just want to reiterate particular. again that aged pensioners are already on the card, so it's already happening. But I also want to reiterate that a repealing legislation is already sitting on the House table floor right now. All they have to do is enact it or do nothing until December and let the contract run out. Privatisation, getting rid of privatisation that is actually occurring across the settling system and social security system right now through consultants and all of that is a priority for ALP as I understand it. I can't, I'm not here to spruik at ALP, but I'm not going to sit here for an ALP bash either i will go back to linda burney's statement last week in paper in public as much as you can do the fundamental principle that alp has on the basics cards and the cash or debit card is it should be on a voluntary basis if people want those sort of income management then that's their decision it is not up to labor or anyone else to tell them what to do at the moment it's comp it's compulsion and that is not labor's policy position it's not labor's position and since macklin and all the people that instigated basics cards under the new income management scheme have gone that has been the alp position as i've understand it i do I, I separate and I and I examine the facts as they stand, not as my personal bias or political leanings want to. And when I look at the facts and based on the evidence, I see action on this side to end compulsory income management. I see expansion efforts on this side. So I'm very clear about that. We have been speaking to cardholders, including women in Seduna who have been raped and assaulted in Seduna. One mum from Seduna had to show her mastectomy scars. You know that was what was demanded on her to get a transfer of income from an injury recipient. Yeah, you know, we we speak to Bev in Kanana. We speak to people on the ground, but it's um 
from the very get-go, this has been an attack on social security. And it's, you know, we know what happened with, you know, the fraud. It wasn't just a, a lie. It was a fraud that was committed to roll out enter. And we know that while they restored the, you know, ALP restored the um, the, the, the Aboriginal, uh, the, the Racial Discrimination Act, they did not end the program. And that's not okay. And the hawks like Macklin and all of that, I didn't get on with her. We had some brilliant blues because she you know I did not agree with her ideological policy and she's gone they're gone that yeah there's two members of the right-wing caucus left standing from that era and one's resigning so there's one guy left out of all of that bunch that we're trying to expand and I just want to say we have worked and lobbied ALP for seven years every day begging and pleading for change and we finally get here we finally get to a point where they're actually standing out there in media right now if they don't end this card they're done that will be unelectable ever again because so many people know now. We have backed them into this wonderful corner where they have to act or they're out. They will never become, you know, and not just, I don't even feel that that was even necessary because it was Albo that brought the issue forward. He was the one that came forward with it on Marcus Paul and from Marcus Paul to the National Press Club the other day to the leaders' debate, you know, to the leaders' debate speaking about it, we're going to scrap it. There, there is... There's only so much denial and disbelief you can accommodate, all right? This has become a key issue in the election. We have fought so hard to get it here. The minute we get it here, everyone goes, oh, no, 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 no. It's like it's really frustrating from our perspective. It's like, why don't ALP speak out more against the card? And when they do, people go, oh, I don't believe you. It's like, what do you want? Blood and scarification. They have to be elected first. I understand Labor's past, absolutely. I understand, like, and the one bill, that the, the extension bill, not the expansion, the one extension bill, they were wedged, okay, 70 million of funding held hostage by the NLP, okay, you know, there's not much they could do with that one. But every bill, every expansion process since we managed to get Murray Watt on board oh with the state, the state ALP have always been with us in this fight. Murray Watt turned that around and withdrew bipartisan consent in 2017. That's how long Labor have been opposing in Senate on record cash at CDC. All right. And since Linda Burney came into office, every word out of second word out of her mouth has been about ending compulsory income management. So it's like, you know, I can only go on the facts as they stand. So I'm sorry if that's not enough, but like we we want to end what's happening in Saduna. We want to end what's happening in Alice Springs. We've, you know, lots of very tiny humans are dead now because of these programs. And I'm the one that speaks to their parents. Okay. I'm the one copping the shit from media and I'm the one being called a liar in press. Yet we have listened to thousands of stories of devastating harm from people all over the country, white, black, in between, <laughs> chocolate and green. It doesn't matter. The human suffering has is enough. The fact one person ended their lives. The first week of the Seduna rollout, one young man said, stuff his all, broke into a bottle shop, got drunk, went and drowned himself in the river, being chased by police. The first week, that should have ended the program. It should have ended it, and it didn't. All right, I'm as indignant and as angry as everyone else. I'm just trying to put on my professional face and look at the policy as a whole, which needs to go. And I don't care how we get there. I don't care how dirty we have to play. I don't care who, what political party we have to straight on to get to the summit. We are at the summit right now. And if we can get them into office, we can hold them to this. We can sit on their laps if we have to, to make sure that this legislation goes through. Let's hear from Aidan. So, um, the basics card, the difference between that is it's only 50% quarantined and it was voluntary uh, unless it was court ordered. Um, Amanda's right. Uh, I, I've listened to Amanda Jocelyn Tree, yeah. absolutely ball her eyes out <sighs> just from the stress of wondering how she's going to pay a utility bill. People have been removed from the card uh, for various reasons, for mental health, for other health issues and put on weekly payments. Even those people have been returned to the full cashless welfare card. Um, and so, in theory, you're stopping people from um, accessing alcohol, porn, um, and I forget the other thing, gambling, I think it's meant to be. Um, but when I first went to Saduna, I was speaking to um, the manager of the only job networks provider and disability employment service provider in Saduna. And... He said to me, 
if you think it stopped the alcohol, it hasn't. Um, it can, hasn't at all. Can I speak without an interruption, please? Um, and if you think it's uh, stopped people, just go down to the tavern yourself and you'll see that it's full of Indigenous people and they're out in the, ha in the car park giving hand jobs for a bottle of beer. But don't worry, Hayden, because they don't get paid for it at home. I, I was just absolutely incensed at the indifference of it. But what this is also designed to do, because initially it was 12, some, and Amanda can tell you the exact figure, some $12,000 per person per year to manage this card. And what we've done is outsourced it and we've taken away the duty of care. Um, but <laughs> we've also opened up other legal loopholes because the system's actually not made for this. So, for example, if uh, they needed some information about someone uh, social security history, they used to uh, require a warrant. Uh, but because it's from a private business, Inju, who actually sell this information to other people, they're called data brokers, um, the government can actually buy back this information that's de-identified, which will take anyone from any university less than half an hour to actually identify who people are. Um, and they don't need a warrant for this information. So suddenly we've just taken away all of the protections that come with the, the system in itself. Um, but on the same token, the government's been absolutely fantastic and on point here that um, they've divided and conquered again. So rather than be angry at the government for a system that's actually failing us, um, we're actually angry at INJU and the cash, uh, the compulsory income management program, rather than the fact that our system's actually no longer working for us because it's, and you know, call me crazy, but I, I kind of feel like all of these things where we're factory farming the poor and making a lot of money out of it and actually not providing any service or bettering anyone's life, it's kind of designed to prove that the system can no longer be sustained. Therefore, let's abolish it. And you were right, Angela, before when you said Twiggy is just so... Oh, he uh, did a report that was commissioned by Tony Abbott called Creating Parity. And in it is the blueprint for all of this and um, mutual obligations and work for the doll and all of these heinous systems that not only are making other people money, but in, in the introduction of uh, the trial in Seduna, um, and the CDP program, which is basically the black version of Work for the Dole, um, you're stuck in it much, much longer. But the services that used to be offered and paid for by the council are now put out to the people doing the CDP program. It, it's just everywhere I look at it, it stinks. And people's lives are at risk and they're being stuck in this entrenched poverty. And we're just talking about taking a few people off. And again, Angela, you mentioned that the Labor Party have had their opportunity to stand up on this before and to make a difference on it. And I, I've just seen it rolled out further ever since the suspension of the Racial Discrimination Act. And yeah, I could go on for ages about this and I don't really want to be giving a lecture, but it, it really just, it, it's unconscionable. Let's move on to the final issue I wanted to raise, which was the, the rate of job seeker. Um, I guess, first of all, we'll go through one of, you know, each in turn, I mean, why should job seeker be raised and what does it mean that the ALP has refused to even review the rate of job seeker, which was a promise they took to the last election, but now they've, now they've canceled that. Ange, do you want to get started with this one? Yeah, thanks, Alex. So I am um, bewildered and disappointed by this, I have to say. Um, Labor, in my opinion, are actually making a fatal error here. I mean, you can't position yourself as a party for the broader working class people and not be serious about providing a decent safety net for people that need income support. Um, and it's, you know, it's really bizarre. The promises they took into the 2019 election are actually better than this time round. So, and it doesn't make a lot of sense as they continue on with the mantra about improving or fixing um, cost of living pressures. So, I mean, raising the rate of income support would be one of the ultimate reforms required to actually ease um, the burden of cost uh, of living pressures for people. So, I mean, we've seen people campaigning on raising the rate for many years now, 
and the sheer fact that the cost of living, wage stagnation and the housing crisis is finally mainstream news, um, it just makes it even more perplexing and maddening that Labor are perhaps maybe too frightened to present an alternate position. Um, and as I said earlier on, like people have an innate want to help others actually. And the polls are favourable around this, raising the rate. So the fact that Labor have not um, made this a major election promise is, yeah, it's extremely disappointing. And, I mean, I saw a stat the other day that there are just seven houses across the entire Australia um, that are affordable for people on Job Seeker. I mean, seven houses, you know, we, you have to really let that sink in. Um, and we know that people in our communities are going hungry every day. They're going without medicine. They can't purchase basic items. They can't support their children's education, you know, buy uniform books, you know, all that type of just stuff that 40 years ago, it was really not a problem. Um, and, you know, this policy, it really is just the ultimate abuse and cruelty that the major parties are not going to raise the rate of income support. You know, they'll keep spending money on prisons and defence, no problem, but there would be much less crime if people were lifted out of poverty. I mean, that's an absolute no-brainer. During COVID, we saw that the rate of job seeker was doubled. And why was this done? Because the government acknowledges that nobody can live on job keeper payments. Um, you know, it's extremely telling. Just this week, um, I was outraged to see our uh, Liberal MP, Ken Wyatt, come out and say that pollies need a pay rise. I mean, come off it, you know. This is coming from a bloke that earns $426,000 a year. That's just over $7,000 a week he lives off. You know, it goes a long way to explain um, the toxic government policy that we see around income support. Because these politicians have absolutely no idea what it is like to try and pay the rent bills and put food on the table. Like it's an abstract notion for them. They have absolutely no clue what it is like to try and live in this world. Um, like when I think about my family, you know, a conservative food shop for a family of five to get the basics, that's about $150 a week without, you know, being fancy. But a lot of families on income support, they have no more than $50 a week left to buy food. So, you know, the sums don't add up. People, I, you know, people can't purchase things that their children need. Um, you know, it's really, it's quite distressing. And I see this at work every day with the people that I work with. Um, yeah, and it's just people, the struggle in the community, it is very real and it's just getting worse, worse and worse every day. What we have seen is um, Labor have promised 30,000 new social housing properties. So this has actually um, been their pitch as a solution to the cost of living pressures um, and in relation to income support. I mean, it's a drop in the ocean. In Victoria alone, we have over 110,000 people on the public housing waiting list. I mean, the only way people have any real chance of surviving in the disastrous housing crisis that we have is to dramatically lift the income support payments above the poverty line. But to be honest, even then, it's not guaranteed that they will still be able to afford rent, but at least, you know, it's some kind of a beginning. Um, Really, what I see is both the major parties, they're just resigning people to a lifetime of poverty. Um, but it really doesn't need to be this way. Like, we are a wealthy nation. If we tax the billionaires and corporations and spread the wealth more equitably, everyone would have a good opportunity to have, you know, a really great life and have everything they need, have all their human rights, their basic human rights met. You know, I'm a mother of three kids and I worry about my kids' futures. Like, our kids' futures are on the line. I mean, it's it's just simple. We need income support payments to be lifted above the poverty line. But it's not just that. We need so many reforms across all our systems. We need free health care. We need free, you know, childcare. 
um, free quality dental services, access to good quality public housing for everybody that needs it, um, and just a wide range of support services that are going to improve people's lives. And so I think, you know, as a society and especially leaning up to the elections, we need to think about who we're voting for. We need to keep campaigning and fighting um, to stop the cuts to all the systems because soon, if it keeps going this way, there's going to be nothing left. Uh, thanks, Ange. Amanda, do you have any comments on JobKeeper? Sorry, job seeker. Sorry, job yes, seeker. Um, yes, yes. You said, well, you asked why it should be raised. It's like, well, it's 42% below the poverty line. You know, who does that? Who keeps um, people in deliberate, you know, by political choice alone? It's ridiculous. For me, um, examining the the issue, it's also, it's a it's an in-practice in breach of, of, you know, international cultural economic rights. So it's, again, back to the human rights issues. The government is obliged. It's not... Social security entitlements are not a privilege bestowed upon a public. They are a requirement and obligation of governments all around the world. Those who can pay should pay, either in cash or in kind. That's written into the law. So, and the fact that it's supposed to meet, there is a list of things it has to do, and it has to meet people's basic needs for housing, food, education. Okay, that's it. Bare minimum, but it has to meet those needs. And job seeker payment, of all the payments that are out there, job seeker payment does not meet those basic needs. So it's an in-practice breach of the Act. And we're signatories to that. We've ratified that. So there's no excuses there. Um, I have friends that are rationing medication right now. So this is an issue that is important for me as well. And my son had to fight for two years with cancer trying to get onto a DSP who was on job seeker who could not pay his meds at all. $380 a week meds. 180 something six dollars he was getting on YA and then he went up like a little tiny bit when he got job seeker so all right we have been through this ringer but but and this is not going to be a popular opinion you may want to plug your ears ALP didn't say they weren't ever going to raise job seeker and they were never going to do a review what they did drop was the shortened era review root and branch review and if you actually need a root and branch review right now given all the evidence is already on the table that would have taken a year Okay, that would have taken a year, cost a lot of money. And meanwhile, another year's worth of people would have been starving and rationing meds and the shit system going to shit. All right, so they didn't say that. Media did, and everyone grabbed onto it, which is really strange because half the people that are grabbing onto the media are the ones saying, don't believe the Murdoch press. Well, actually, when you read what they wrote, what they said at ACOS, when you, but more than that, where how they clarify what they said, they said they could not do it in the first budget. So between September and December is when all raise the rate people need to lobby, lobby, lobby to the point where you're sitting on them, where you don't give them room but to do it because it's between the September budget, which, you know, ALP could right now say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this, get in and find there's nothing, to find there's no way to do it or contracts or this or that has been done. And then we'll be screwed. It'll be, oh, Labor are evil, all right? Do another Scott Morrison, announce, 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 or get in there because the first budget comes in September. That's not very far away. Okay, and then you've got September to the MYFEO, whatever you call it, in December, that budget. That's where I reckon you're likely to see something to do with Job Seeker happen. I don't know. I'm not ALP, so I don't speak to this policy with them. I have used absolutely every access and position I have to raise this policy, and I'm constantly sending information through the channels that I got about the dire situation, how dire it is, making sure that the people I know that have access have access to the information. But it needs to be it needs to be raised because it's cruel and inhumane and wrong to keep people suffering when you can make a decision. You know, it's the Corona Supplement did it perfectly, it just absolutely perfectly. But there are still groups out there today going, no, you should suffer my taxpayer dollars. So it goes right back to this perception that public spending has anything to do with taxpayer dollars again and that lie that's built up over generations. You know, how are, you, how are we supposed to meet that? All right, so but my position is that, you know, you asked what ALPs claim to being an alternative to Morrison. For the last nine years, the Morrison government has been trying to kill me in many different ways, okay? The ALP government, one, hasn't been in power to make any changes and it's a case where I'd rather solid change then announcements that lead to nowhere and bullshit i've had enough bullshit so there, to me there's no comparison this party when you look at the bulk of their efforts since introduction of medicare to now have been about trying to stop people dying 
you've got a government out there that is trying to kill people and is successfully doing that. 45,000 Australians have died needless deaths, and that's not counting income management deaths, okay? You know, that's not counting all the people that have died as a result. The government won't give us the data on that. But 18% of people that started on CDC and, and forced income management no longer, okay, are no longer on the system at all. We know that. So that's 18% of people that have disappeared off the system. We don't know if they've gotten work or pissed off or died. But we do know that 16 people have ended their lives. We know that four of those were children under 12 years old. Okay, so things have to change. And I, it's like, do I think ALP is stupid? Because they can be at times, but as a whole, no, they're not stupid. They know that something needs to be done. They've said as much themselves over the last, you know, thingy. But, yeah, dropping the review, the short and nearer review, was blown out into something that I don't think it represents fairly when I look at the facts, you know. I think that if you want to change, that you better get in between September and December, go and sit on Parliament lawn. I'd be right there with you, but I don't think media and other groups with interest, you know, have actually portrayed what the ALP said in the correct way. Because when I read it, they said, well, every budget we are going to, you know, review and look at each of the payments. And that's what I saw. And I read that and I've had that confirmed from the top to the bottom, from local MP to the high. And, and so it's like, that's what I'm reading. That's what everyone's feeding back to me. And I can only say that, you know, this, their statements, this was the statement at ACOS, what he said at ACOS said the same thing. So it's like, you know, I can only do that. I know that walking into an office after this nine years of shitstorm, nobody can guarantee anything. You know, we're a trillion in debt. That, that's got nothing to do with raising the rate. But I'm saying we don't know what they've done, what contracts are in place. We don't know. And and I wouldn't be walking in and making promises either. See, the, the thing with CDC is that it's actually saving the government $321 million. You know, it's ending a contract and it's ending privatisation. So it's actually a cost saver, which is a lot easier to push through media right now in an election than trying to, you know, you, I, I see every day because we battle them every day, the opinions of the public out there, even of ABC and media out there that we should be in suffrage, we should be this, you know, we should be doing that. But I was just going to say... It, Hayden mentioned the, the forest review. It wasn't just about CDC. Go and have a read of that document. Every single change since 2013 to the social security system has its, um, has its origin in that document. Even Very the change of names. Maybe let Amanda finish and then Hayden can have a go. Yeah. When I go, I'm actually doing a review of the forest review right now in my little academic buzzword when I can after this fight's done but I've started the review process now with another person and we're and we're going through the every single significant change including mutual obligations changing the names changing ages all the things that you actually mentioned Angela can be tracked back to the forest review and I was astounded and and worse things worse is that they want to expand CDC to all incomes and they want to include NDIS payments so that means NDIS providers will be on the cart that's the first reach outside of the welfare group, you know, I hate the word, but it's what they use, you know, so outside of the social security thing. So it's like NIDS payments don't come to you in cash. They come to an account that you can access and blah, 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 their arrangements. So the fact that they want to extend, expand to NDIS and all of this is very concerning. But every change since 2013 to social security has its roots in that document. You want to get rid of all of this crap, stop billionaires accessing. He's not even a registered lobbyist, you know, actually ask government to enforce the law and stop this man coming to our parliament. That's the best, one of the easiest. But if you want to change the rate, you've got between September and the MyFio budget. I would really push it. I'll be right there and we'll do everything we can to support that, you know. But um, I, don't, I don't accept the misrepresented statements because it's like us all trying to kill me, group of people not trying to kill me. So that's where I stand. And, and I've been very open about that on Twitter and everywhere else as well. Okay, and that my decision is he wants me dead, he doesn't, that's it you know, and that's the best I can do. The rest is politics and window dressing to someone like me who is battling a terminal illness with a child with a terminal illness. You know, we don't have the luxury of politicking about this kind of stuff. It's like, who's going to kill us first, <laughs> you know? And so it's a probably a really bad position to take and selfish, but it is for the first time, actually, it's the first selfish decision I've made. So um, I absolutely respect the views of, of other people. I just have a different one <laughs> and, and that's how it is. So thank you for inviting me today to answer all these questions. I hope I haven't been a complete pain in the ass. Yeah. No, no, thanks, Amanda, for that. But we'll turn now to Hayden for final comments um, on, on this. 
issue of job seeker okay well um and i'll try and be as concise as i can um look when you look at the uh fact that just in 2020 we pretty much eradicated poverty in australia and eradicated homelessness and it was for such a brief period um but some of these people were dreaming for 20 years or so about having that third meal for a day and we showed people what it's like and then we just ripped it away from them and told them suddenly we're not all in this together and um we, we're struggling through a, pan, a pandemic and everyone deserves all this extra assistance except for the unemployed or the disabled or the underemployed um then you've got people like jerry harvey and google this stuff in 2014 proudly boasted in the media that the unemployed are such a blight on the taxpayer fund and public society that they should be starved into non-existence. He actually said this and ever since then hasn't paid a cent in tax. And when JobKeeper was rorted by all of those large companies, Qantas, et cetera, also did the same. And the millions of dollars that he took, he boasted that he gave to his shareholders and would not be paying back. So when you've got this disparity of some people being extremely well looked after and tickled under the chin and other people being told it's your fault for being stuck in this life of poverty. I, I just find it <clears throat> something I, I, I cannot reconcile. Um, I'm nearly 50 years old and I, I had lifetime tenancy and social housing, which here in South Australia is a 20 plus year waiting list. Um, I got married and it was a domestic violence situation and it broke down very, very quickly. Um, as a result, I was kicked out of my public housing and banned for the next 12 months. I spent the next 14 months homeless and I applied for over 450 houses. And that's a lot of um, my attention and taking away from the trauma I was going through at the time and also still showing up to do what I do. Um, I was turned down from all of those houses because it was more than 37% of my income on a DSP. I went through so much trauma that I could not handle flatmates and I just wanted to sit and work out what the hell had just happened in my life. Um, I was lucky enough to find a place and I'm now sharing with five other people and I'm renting by the room. And these people also cannot get social housing and have um, mental health issues that are undiagnosed and are on this cyclical um, calendar that seems to just roll with each other and it's just it is more trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma that when i was a kid i was lucky if one in 20 people knew someone who was homeless and we just seem to know everyone knows someone who's homeless now i i've spent the fortune or misfortune of being homeless in four cities in capital cities in australia and every single one of them i had to step over so many homeless people to get to the airport to go home and it just breaks my heart that we just go, do you know what, that person deserves it. It, it's, it, it doesn't sit with me very well. And um, a, a friend of mine who came with me to uh, Parliament House in 2019 on a lobbying trip for raising New Start or Job Seeker, and can I just say, everyone's had an opportunity to raise this. We've been lobbying for over 30 years for a raise to New Start. Um, she said to me, it's not lost on me that all my stuff's in a, a storage locker. I have to sleep in my car because I can't sleep in the storage locker. Um, I meet with at least 10 people on a regular basis, whether it be about my homelessness, my unemployed, um, getting into whatever it was she explained. She said, and a year later, I'm still seeing all of those people and they're all on six figure salaries, but my life hasn't changed. So that's why I think we need to increase it. Um, and, and just finally, because I probably won't get another a chance to speak, Inju made an awful lot of money off the back of poor people who were targeted and punished. And now uh, they find themselves where they get to escape normal rules such as financial service regulations. And they've got the basis and they've got the money from all these poor people to now factory farm the rest of the community. So you've got buy now, pay later for FUPAY, for example, which is run by the same organisation. You've got a kid's prepaid uh, credit card banking account called Spriggy, which is also run by them. It, it is just 
I, I can't believe the stuff I'm watching and no one is outraged by it because they don't think it'll affect them. It affects every single one of us. Um, and just finally, sorry, <laughs> um, when we did see Job Seeker doubled for that brief period, all of that money was immediately spent in our local communities. It wasn't hoarded away or sent overseas. It was spent on things we need, like dental, healthcare, food, cars being fixed. And so taking that money away, you've taken the lifeline out of our communities. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. That brings us to the end of this show. Uh, thank you for joining in, and a big thank you to our special guests, um, Hayden, Amanda, and Angela. Uh, if you like the work we do, please don't forget to become a Green Left supporter and or show, uh, show us some love on Patreon. And please share this show with your friends, give it a thumbs up on YouTube, and until next time, we'll see you again.